Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you for the Cato Institute for hosting us here today. Uh, John uh, mentioned how my first volume came out right before the events earlier in the decade uh, changed so much of American life, and I thought, uh, surely, knock on wood, things will be different this time. So I turned up in New York on Tuesday to appear yesterday on the Morning Joe show on MSNBC, got to my hotel, they handed me my room key, and it was room 911. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's really a good sign. I'm not really superstitious. And I thought, surely that's a good omen that things will go differently until I woke up yesterday morning to see the news of Senator Kennedy's passing, uh, the email of my cancellation on Morning Joe. I've been rebooked for next week, uh, and so I urge all of you to join me in praying for the health of Robert Byrd. <laughs> well, I, I think I should begin by offering a brief explanation you know, it's pretty ironic, a guy who writes two fat books who uses the word brief in his opening sentence. Um, I should offer you a brief explanation of why I would spend the better part of a decade doing something that is so unconventional according to the usual publishing norms uh, of today, which is writing a long, wide-scale, sprawling narrative about Ronald Reagan and his effect on American political life about events that would seem to have been pretty thoroughly covered and well understood by now. Uh, well, I have a lot of reasons, but the main point was that I was sure even as recently as 10 years ago that Reagan was going to end up not eulogized, but as I put it, coolagized by the media academic complex. In other words, like another once popular Republican president, Calvin Coolidge, uh, he would be handled roughly by academia uh, uh, and so forth. And, and, you know, look for a couple of years after he left office in the late 80s that this would be uh, the way it would in fact unfold. But then, along the way, over the last decade, something surprising happened and unexpected. Uh, Reagan's reputation started to soar, and even a great many liberals started to like him. Now, not all of him, and that's an important point that we'll come back to. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, a lot of conservatives, I think, have come to overly romanticize Reagan and to see him too often through a superficial, gauzy lens. And therein we need a broad gauge narrative history that is revisionist. I've got a number of revisions, uh, uh, I think, in this, um, in this account. Um, if you look at some of the liberal writers who've come to write admiringly of Reagan or parts of Reagan, people like uh, Pat Diggins was mentioned, Richard Reeves. Richard Reeves is one of the more interesting cases. He wrote an article in 1979 in Esquire magazine called Why Ronald Reagan Won't Make It. And his biography of Reagan was President Reagan, the triumph of imagination. And I commented in a review that, uh, you know, you couldn't have gotten Lloyds of London in 1979 to imagine Richard Reeves putting the words Reagan and triumph in the same sentence. Uh, others include uh, Doug Brinkley, uh, Sean Wilentz more recently. Uh, and I think this uh, a rise in Reagan's esteem rivals that of Dwight Eisenhower a decade after, his, uh, after he left office. Uh, now, as has been suggested by John, this admiration tends to be limited to the Cold War story, to the foreign policy story. And the other part of it, of course, is the revelation starting about 10 years ago of Reagan's extensive personal writings back in the 70s, his letters in office, uh, which made us realize that he did a lot of his thinking for himself and was not merely the creature of speech writers and staffers and advisors. Uh, however, um, it, we tend to either ignore or get wrong his domestic policy story. Uh, and so, I'm, to paraphrase Reagan's famous movie line, we're still left with the question, where's the rest of him? The conventional wisdom still tends to be uh, that uh, the rest of Reagan's presidency was either a fiasco, such as his domestic economic policy. I mean, every other Paul Krugman column these days in the Times seems to be about the disaster of the Reagan era domestically. Uh, or there are other disasters people point to, such as the Iran-Contra scandal, uh, which was a genuine disaster. Um, but my argument is that this disjunction between Reagan's foreign statecraft and his domestic statecraft is a major interpretive mistake. And I think that too many of the treatments of Reagan try to abstract from his ideology, uh, which is, to borrow a line from G.K. Chesterton, like trying to tell the story of a saint without mentioning God. Uh, now, as I say, I have three or four revisions of Reagan in my book. Uh, the chief one is that it tries to reestablish the fundamental unity of Reagan's statecraft through which both foreign and domestic policy should be evaluated together. Reagan's central idea can be summarized as the view that unlimited government, unlimited government, is uh, hostile to individual liberty, both in its vicious forms like communism, but also in its supposedly benign forms like bureaucracy. And Reagan stated more or less uh, uh, this view himself uh, most clearly in his 1982 speech at Westminster in London, where he said, quote, <laughs> 
There is a threat posed to human freedom by the enormous power of the modern state. History teaches the dangers of government that overreaches, political control taking precedence over free economic growth, secret police, mindless bureaucracy, all combining to stifle individual excellence and personal freedom. Note the conflation there of secret police and mindless bureaucracy, uh, showing that he regards the phenomenon of political life as a continuum and not simply as you know, the communists being something wholly different from the problems of Western democracies. Uh, and that, that is not a coincidence he made clear in his next sentence. Remember, he's talking to uh, uh, the British Parliament, the British political class, which is deeply divided over Margaret Thatcher, right, in 1982. Now, I'm aware, Reagan went on to say in the next sentence, that among us here and throughout Europe, there is legitimate disagreement over the extent to which the public sector should play a role in a nation's economy and life. I'll pause mid-sentence here to ask, uh, add my commentary, which this was Reagan's way of saying, I know you're all not as freedom-loving as me and Maggie. But then he concluded the sentence this way, but on one point all of us are united, our abhorrence of dictatorship in all its forms, close quote. Now, Reagan's domestic policy story is much harder to tell than the foreign policy story because it's more diffuse uh, and the results are more mixed. He won some, he lost some, other things are still a muddle even today. And above all, it lacks the human drama of the Cold War and the summits with Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, as I uh, say early in the book, Reagan never stood in front of the Federal Trade Commission and said, Mr. Regulator, tear down this rule. <laughs> he did, though, have that attitude, uh, as I explained some in the book, and a lot of his appointees, not all of them, but a number of his appointees did too. And there were some dramatic closed-door arguments he had, especially with Tip O'Neill, where Reagan used, at times, language that would have done Lyndon Johnson proud. Maybe later I'll give you some samples. Um, but above all, I think we need to see if we can explain or understand Reagan's seeming contradictions. Uh, on foreign policy, he talked tough about the Soviets, but then reached arms control agreements that dismayed conservatives. And that might have dismayed the pre-presidential Reagan himself. And indeed, many conservatives were apoplectic over this turn in Reagan's statecraft. This is the central focus of uh, Jim Mann's recent book, from whom we'll hear shortly. On the domestic scene, as Bill Niskan had pointed out in his fine early assessment called Reaganomics, Reagan acquiesced to tax increases every year after the initial tax cut package of 1981. And in other areas, just to pick one example, uh, Reagan agreed to impose quote unquote voluntary auto import restraints on Japanese automakers, which cannot by any stretch of the imagination be calculated as a defensible policy by any friend of open markets and free trade. Indeed, Bill Niskanen is among those flinty realists who rejects the idea that the Reagan years should be understood as revolutionary. At the end of his book, he wrote, in the end, there was no Reagan revolution. Now, I have a lot of sympathy uh, with Bill's analysis about that, and I'll be interested to see in what ways, if any, Bill has revised his judgment 20 years after writing that. Um, but I think we miss some important aspects of Reagan's statecraft and maybe misjudge the results if we weigh things on a purely abstract scale. Back in the 1930s, Winston Churchill wrote an essay called Consistency in Politics, partly to explain his own party switching. Remember, Reagan was a party switcher too. And Churchill wrote this, a statesman in contact with the moving current of events and anxious to keep the ship of state on an even keel and steer a steady course may lean all his weight now on one side and now on the other. His arguments in each case, when contrasted, can be shown to be not only very different in character, but contradictory in spirit and opposite in direction. Yet his object will throughout have remained the same. His resolves, his wishes, his outlook may have been unchanged, but his methods may be verbally irreconcilable. We cannot call this inconsistency. In fact, it may be claimed to be the truest consistency. The only way a man can remain consistent amid the changing circumstances is to change with them while preserving the same dominating purpose." Close quote. Well, Reagan's dominating purpose at home was to shrink, as he put it in his first inaugural address, to shrink the size and influence of the federal government. And abroad, his dominating purpose was, to paraphrase Lincoln, to place communism on the course of ultimate extinction. And I think most of Reagan's course corrections, both at home and abroad, can be explained within the compass of Churchill's understanding of consistency in politics. 
On the domestic side, to pick one example, consider Reagan's agreement in 1982 to raise taxes by $98 billion over the next three years, a deal that caused a lot of conservatives to cry that they had been betrayed 